Hey there, and welcome back to Biblical Theology Today. Uh, today we're going to take a little bit of a break from looking at the theme of God's people coming to these dangerous and deadly waters, and we're going to see that what we talk about today still is very relevant to that theme, and, and we'll really kind of come back to that theme towards the end. But today the focus is going to be on the Song of Songs. And we're going to focus on the Song of Songs because the Song of Songs is this book that maybe if we do a Bible in a year plan, we, we read it. Maybe uh, if there's a very good pastor, they'll have us read it uh, during premarital counseling. But by and large, we just skip over the book. And we understand that it's God's Word. We understand that it's a part of the Bible. But we treat it like it's not a lot of the times. We'll read Ephesians and Genesis and Romans. But when was the last time you heard a pastor stand up in a pulpit during a Sunday morning sermon, and even reference the Song of Songs. Not even just, you know, preach a sermon on it, but, but even reference it. And so we want to take some time to look at that book just because it's an oddity uh, and help, hopefully, help people understand it better and why it's, un, why it's in the Bible and why it is very, very important. And we want to argue that, like all of Scripture, the Song of Songs is ultimately pointing us to the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to begin, we want to highlight that the, the title of the book is not Song of Solomon. Um, a lot of Bibles will say that that's the title, but in Song of Songs 1-1, it says the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. And so the title that's being given to the book is Song of Songs. And because of that, a lot of Christians throughout church history have nicknamed the Song of Songs, the Holy of Holies. And they've done that for two reasons. The first is that that's how you do a superlative in Hebrew. You repeat the word twice. And so uh, the same way that we have Holy of Holies, and that is the most holy of all places, we have the Song of Songs, which is the greatest song of all the songs. It's not just better than some other songs. It's the greatest song ever. That's what the authors claim. The second reason that Christians have nicknamed it the Holy of Holies is because there's been a conviction throughout church history, and, and we'll see why here in just a minute, but there's been this conviction that if you want to know how much God loves you, the place where you should go is the Song of Songs. If you want to know uh, how much he loves you, if you want to be drawn most, uh, most, most clearly into the presence of that love and have it the most clearly articulated to you, you need to go to that book. If you want to peel back the veil and walk into the presence of God's love and his benevolence towards you, the Song of Songs is where you can go to do that best. And so we want to interpret scripture with other Christians and not always against other Christians because we know that there's one Holy Spirit who wrote the one scriptures and speaks to, to all of his people throughout all time periods and in all places. And so we want to be with the church. We want to be with what the Spirit has done in the reading and life of, of other Christians. And so we want to take some time today to think about what other Christians have said about the Song of Songs and then look at the book itself and, and see uh, if we agree. And so we're going to start by doing that. We're, I'm going to present today seven reasons why I think we should interpret the Song of Songs as primarily about the relationship between Jesus and his people. And I hope that these are persuasive to you because they're persuasive to me. And I think that ultimately all of scripture is about Jesus, including this rather obscure book. So let's get started. The, the first argument is that the, um, the, the Jewish people have always held to a view of the Song of Songs, which argues that it's about the relationship between God and God's people. Uh, this, is, this has always been the Jewish interpretation of the book. And as Christians, uh, we have a distinct understanding of the Old Testament because we're reading the Old Testament in light of what Christ has said and done. But we should remember that, that God gave these books before Christ came. And so it's good, as we try to understand this book, to look at how people before Christ understood the book and, and even... Uh, Jewish readers who are after Christ, whether they're messianic or not, it is good to see how they continue to read the book. And whenever we, we do that, what we'll see is that there has been one Jewish interpretation of the Song of Songs. 
every Jewish interpreter has argued that the Song of Songs is very clearly about God and his love for his covenant people. And they're so convinced over this that the Song of Songs was read every single Passover as Jews from all over the place gathered in Jerusalem at the temple for the Passover sacrifice. As, as they're getting ready for the Passover, they're reading the Song of Songs, and they're reading it in light of, of redemption, in, in, in light of redemptive history. And they're reading it, trying to understand why God has saved them, and, and the conclusion is uh, the same thing that they concluded in Deuteronomy 7. God didn't save because he was super impressed with Israel, or because they were bigger than all the other nations, or because of their righteousness. He saved because of this great love that he had for them. And the Song of Songs in Jewish theology was actually nicknamed the mini Psalter. They, they said that it was this condensed version of the Psalms. And so if you want to learn how to pray, you can go to the Psalms and you can read the prayers of David and learn how to pray that way. But they said if you really want like this express ticket to learn how to pray well, you can go to the, the Song of Songs and it'll teach you how to pray. It'll teach you how God speaks about you and the love that he has for you, and it gives you words to express your love and adoration back towards him. And so this has always been the Jewish interpretation, which I think should hold a little bit of weight as we consider how to interpret this very odd book. But what we also see is that this is the consensus Christian view. Robert Jensen is a really intriguing theologian that I have some quibbles with, but I, I also benefit from him a lot. He's written recently a... Um, he, he, he's passed away now, but, but a year or two before he died, he wrote this um, magnificent commentary on the Song of Songs. And in its introduction, Jensen appeals to church history, and, and this is what he said. He said, it was the unanimous answer of Jewish and Christian pre-modern exegesis. So, so he's saying every Jewish person who interpreted the Bible, every Christian person who interpreted the Bible before about the 1800s, all of them said the same thing about how to interpret the Song of Songs. He said it was the opinion of the ancient rabbis and the later Jewish commentators and of the fathers of the church and the medieval and Reformation commentaries, commentar uh, commentators that these poems belong in the canon of Scripture because the lovers are the biblical Lord and his people, whether Yahweh and Israel or Christ in the church. And Jensen is right. I've spent a lot of time with church history. I've spent a lot of time looking at how uh, earlier theologians have interpreted this book. And, and before the year 1800, you're not going to find a single Christian who is going to argue that the Song of Songs is not about Christ in the church. After the 1800s, you'll start finding people who will make that argument. But we have 1,800 years of the Holy Spirit speaking to his people, and 1,800 years of, of unanimous consensus that this book is about Jesus and the church. And so I think that needs to hold a lot of weight for us. And it's not because I'm, I'm a Roman Catholic who always wants to go with the tradition. I'm, I'm Presbyterian. I'm Reformed. I follow Calvin on his reading of church history, that we have one final authority whenever it comes to theology, which is the Bible, sola scriptura. But sola scriptura doesn't mean solo scriptura. It doesn't mean that we can only use the Bible to, to develop our theology. We need to look at how the Christians who have come before us read the scriptures. And if all the Christians who came before us read the Bible a certain way, and then we come to the same passages and we get different ideas, then, then we're making the claim that the Holy Spirit uh, just really didn't reveal things to the church until he revealed them to us. And maybe that's true. Maybe, maybe we'll find a place where, where we really think that we're right and we're confident to go against the tradition, but we really need to check ourselves and make sure that we make uh, very humble decisions whenever we do interpretation along these lines. There have been very godly, very smart people who have gone before us. The Spirit's spoken to them as well and has led them in their reading of the text. And I think that humility dictates that we listen to them, and if we're going to disagree, we do so carefully and humbly. And so this should hold a lot of weight for us. Uh, we should read the Bible with the tradition, not against it, as much as possible. And so uh, let's get into the Song of Songs and, and the scriptures themselves and see if we start having some other reasons 
for, for holding this view that it's ultimately about Christ and the church. And, and here's one of the strongest ones. Paul teaches us that marriage is ultimately about what? He says in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. He teaches us that marriage is ultimately about the relationship between Jesus and his people. So, I would make the argument that even if we say that the Song of Songs is just about human marriage, even, even if we want to make the argument that it's primarily about human marriage, we have to be willing to say that it reaches further than that, and it speaks of the covenant between Jesus and his people. If you want to make the argument that it's primarily just about human, human marriage, fine. But you have to make the, the, if you're making that argument, you also have to notice what Paul says here. And Paul says human marriage is never just about human marriage. It's always a commercial for the greater thing. Uh, marriage, marriage is a commercial to help people see the beauties of the relationship between Christ and the church, and then they'll want to be drawn into relationship with, with Christ. It's a picture of the love that Christ has for us and the love that we're supposed to reciprocate towards him. And so even if this book is primarily just about my human marriage and trying to make it stronger, it has to be speaking beyond that because marriage is always speaking beyond that. It's always pointing us to the greater mystery and the greater union. And so this book has to have, in some way, uh, something to teach us about Christ and the church. But if we go on, I think that we can start making the argument that the Song of Songs isn't primarily about human marriage. It's primarily about Christ and the church, and it's only secondarily about human marriage. And here's, here's why I'm going to make that argument. Jesus says in John 5.39 that the scriptures, and, and if you think about what is the Bible for Jesus, it's the Old Testament. He makes the argument that the scriptures bear witness to him. The Old Testament bears witness to him. He says in John 5.39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. And so he makes the argument that the Bible is ultimately about what? It's about him. And then he, he gets um, a little bit more granular in Luke's gospel, Luke 24, 27. He sa it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to his disciples in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus isn't just making the claim that big picture, the Old Testament is ultimately pointing us to him. He's making the argument in Luke that, that how much of the scriptures are about him. He says, that it, it, he says in, in Luke 24, 27, that Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So it's not just the Old Testament as a whole. It's not just Old Testament big pictures about Jesus. It's that everything in the Old Testament is about him. And then Luke 24, 44, uh, he's talking to the disciples and he said, I had to die and be resurrected, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now, Song of Songs is not part of the law, it's not part of the prophets, and then Jesus specifically mentions the Psalms here. But uh, in, the, in the Jewish way of structuring the Bible, the term Psalms is really serving a broader purpose than just the book of Psalms. It's encapsulating everything that we call the writings. And so it's very easy, uh, or it's very common, excuse me, it's very common for Jews, uh, the way that they structure their Bible, to, to structure it law, prophets, Psalms, meaning law, prophets, and, and kind of everything else, all the other writings. And so he's saying that in the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms, there are things written about him, and, and all of it, everything in the whole Old Testament is ultimately about him. Is Song of Songs in the Old Testament? It is. So what is Jesus claiming? That it's about him. And it's not secondarily about him. It's primarily about him. And so we keep going, and we see that this becomes even, even clearer. The Song of Songs is about this, uh, these poems that go back and forth between a beloved and, and the lover, between a man and a woman. And throughout the Old Testament, God frequently speaks of himself as Israel's husband. This happens in Ezekiel, whenever uh, chapter 16, he, he, it, it talks about how he's married uh, the woman Israel, that she's been unfaithful. We get a clear picture of this in Hosea. And so if you are one of the readers of Song of Songs, close to the time when it's written, you're hearing the prophets speaking, talking about how 
Israel has been this unfaithful bride, and you see this book that's in your Bible about God, or, or, or about a man and a woman speaking back and forth, and you're going to read it in light of the rest of the Old Testament that you have, and in light of what the prophets say. You're going to hear it as this conversation of, of God and his people talking back and forth. And a lot of times the relationship in the Song of Songs is good. As we'll see in a minute, there are times when it's bad, but you're going to start getting this idea, when, kind of these good parts of the Song of Songs. This is how the relationship between the man and the woman should look. And so I think the original audience, hearing the prophets, reading the rest of the scriptures, is going to naturally interpret the Song of Songs this way. But even more than that, the language used in the song is used in other places in the Old Testament about the temple. The, the Song of Songs includes all kinds of spices. It includes particular types of wood that's, uh, th that are mentioned. It talks about these curtains. Uh, we know the tabernacle has all these curtains around it, and then, and then ultimately the veil between uh, that, that separates the Holy of Holies. And all of the language, especially if you want to pick up Jensen's commentary, Jensen's going to point out very convincingly that all of these things are things that show up in the temple, whether whenever uh, Moses constructed the tabernacle or in Solomon's temple. Uh, all, of the, all of the different kind of details uh, are all coming from, from the temple. And this is why the, the Jews would read the Song of Songs at Passover, because that's whenever they, they're all gathering at the temple. They're outside of the temple. They'll read this book that uses all kinds of temple language to talk about God and, and his people, and it seems like an appropriate book to read in that setting, because there are so many hints uh, that, that take us back to passages about, about the temple. And so if you want more proof on that, pick up Jensen's commentary. But then the, the seventh reason is the song employs a lot of language that was used by the prophets as they called Israel uh, back to God as well. Um, you have the language about the husband and the wife that is very clearly laid out in the prophets and obviously shows up in the song. You have all this language about the temple, and obviously the temple is the place where God meets his people and shows his love towards them. But then you also have all of these, this other language um, throughout the song that the prophets really like to use. Um, two times in the Song of Songs, the woman encounters watchmen. And watchmen, the, really the only other time that that shows up in the Bible is a book like Habakkuk or Ezekiel, where Habakkuk is up on his watchtower, and, and that's associated with his role as a prophet, or whenever uh, God tells Ezekiel to, to set himself up as a watchman, and if he doesn't tell the people of the impending danger, uh, then the blood will be on, on his hands. Uh, the Song of Songs also uses language about Israel being, or, or the woman being like a vineyard quite a bit. A prophet like Isaiah uh, talks about how God planted a vineyard that didn't produce very much fruit, and so he's a disgruntled uh, kind of farmer figure, and he's obviously talking about Israel and how Israel didn't bear much fruit. Uh, I believe that's Isaiah too. And so even, even this language as well finds its parallels in the, in the prophets. And so what does it look like to interpret the song in this way. Um, I want to I want to give a few examples real quick. Um, in in the Song of Songs, chapter three, verses one through five, you have these watchmen, and the um, the woman has run out into the city and she's looking for her beloved, and the watchmen very kindly lead her to her beloved. But then two chapters later, in Song of Songs five two through nine, there's a very bizarre story. The, the man is knocking on the door, and the woman has decided that she doesn't want to get up and let him in. So he continues knocking, and she just lays on her bed and doesn't let, let him in. And then finally, she starts to feel some, some tenderness towards him, starts feeling some love towards him. So she goes over and opens the door, but whenever she does that, he's not there anymore. So she runs out into the city, and this time around, she goes to the watchman and says, please lead me to the beloved, and they don't. Instead, they, they actually physically harm her. They beat her, and then she has this veil on her face that's supposed to symbolize her purity, and they take it from her and run off. And then all of the women of the city come out, and they surround her in a circle, and they start saying, what is your beloved to another beloved? If we try to take that story literally, it makes absolutely no sense. But if we start interpreting it, it in light of the rest of the Old Testament, it makes perfect sense. Who are the watchmen? Well, we said a minute ago, they're the prophets. So the first time the woman has apparently sinned, she's distant from her, 
from her beloved. And she goes to the prophets, she's repentant, and what do the prophets do? A lot in the Old Testament. They lead the people in repentance and lead her back to God. The second time, though, God has been knocking, he's been waiting, he's been knocking, he's been waiting, and the woman has just waited too long. So she finally opens the door, and he's not there. And then she goes to the watchman, and, and this is a very late repentance. Uh, the, the, the Bible says that we should repent when God will still be found, right? And this has been a late repentance. So she goes to the prophets the second time, and they only have harsh words to speak to her, only have judgment to speak to her. And, and then they take her veil away. She's been unfaithful. She hasn't loved her husband well. And then all the women of the city come out and start saying, well, what's your beloved to another? And this is exactly what plays out in, in the history of Israel. Israel's judged. She's punished. And then what is she tempted with? She's tempted to go after Bel. She's tempted to go after Dagon. She's tempted to go after Ashtaroth. The other gods start, start appealing to her. She's been judged. God hasn't done what, what she's hoped God would do. She's been in sin. And the other uh, nations, the other idols start becoming tantalizing to her. And so if we interpret this in, in light of the relationship of God and his people, it makes a lot of sense. If we interpret it in light of the prophets, it makes a lot of sense. And then something like Song of Songs 8.5, I'm really not sure how people don't reach this conclusion when it says, who is that coming up from the wilderness leaning on her beloved? Like, what is one of the biggest stories in the, in the Bible? It's the, it's the exodus and the wilderness wanderings. And how does Israel come out of the promised land? Does she come out exuberant and pumping her fist? No, an entire generation has fallen in the wilderness because of sin and disbelief. And so how does she come out of the wilderness? She comes out leaning on her beloved. How does she come out of the exiles? Broken, leaning on her beloved. But he's still there to offer her his arm. He's still been faithful to her, even through all the sin and all the unfaithfulness and, and all the disobedience and unbelief. God's been faithful. And whenever it's time for Israel to repent and come back, he's a gracious and compassionate husband who offers his arm. And if we're reading Song of Songs this way, we realize that there's a two, verse, uh, two verses at the end of the song that really kind of set the climax for the entire Old Testament. This is where all of Old Testament theology kind of reaches its pinnacle, if we read it this way. Song of Songs 8, 6, and 7 says, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death. And we pause right there. And that's not the statement we need. Love is as strong as death. That's not the statement we need. The statement we need is love is stronger than death. Jealousy is as fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. And so there's this moment that happens here where we've had the love of God and the love of, the, of, the, of Israel uh, shown throughout this entire song. And then we hit this moment and it says love is as strong as death. What's like our biggest fear of what can separate us from God, our sin that leads to death. And so what is stronger, our sin that leads to death or the overwhelming love of God, the flame of God, his, his flaming, fiery love? Which one is going to win? And this verse sets them side by side, and it, and it shows that it looks like death always has the last word. God loves his people, but they've sinned so much, they die, and what happens to them then? And then the Song of Songs says, many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. And so there's a hope that's offered here that somehow God's love is going to overpower the grave. And how does that ultimately happen? It happens when Jesus is resurrected, and by faith we'll be resurrected with him. And again, we see our motif here. What, is, what are the floods a picture of? It's a picture of death. It's a picture of the judgment of God on our sin. And what we learn here is that God's love is going to triumph over sin's uh, sin's power. God's love is going to triumph over death. God's love is going to triumph over everything that tries to separate us from him. We're not going to drown in the waters if we're God's people. God's going to do something magnificent. The Song of Songs doesn't say what it is, but there's a hope that he will do it. He's going to do something magnificent to make sure that the flood waters don't get the last word and death doesn't get the last word. And what he's going to do is, is, is resurrect us in Christ. And so if we're reading Song of Songs this way, we see these two verses as kind of this, this mega uh, 
mountaintop of Old Testament theology and we're awaiting the hope and we're awaiting that one work that God is going to do to triumph over death and, and ultimately it's through the resurrection of Christ. And so I think that this argument that it's primarily about Jesus and the church is very convincing. Uh, and I would encourage you to read the Song of Songs and see for yourself. And as you read the Song of Songs, I, I want to share this quote from Bernard of Clairvaux. He says, in the Song of Songs, it's everywhere that love speaks. If anyone hopes to grasp the sense of what he reads, let him first love. Whereas someone who does not love will not hear, will, will not, uh, whereas someone who does not love will hear or read this song in vain. If you want to understand the Song of Songs, you need to know Jesus first. Because the Song of Songs is about the love that Christ has for his people. And so if you want to understand that love, you first need to experience that love by becoming one of his people. And so Christ offers himself freely to you today. He offers, uh, he offers himself to you because he's loved you since before you were born. We love because he first loved us. And he offers himself freely to all of us by grace. And so if you don't know Christ, embrace him by faith today, and then read the Song of Songs, see the things he says about his people, even be scandalized by them at times. But know that, that Christ loves you, that, that the Father loves you, the Spirit loves you, and, and read this book to know that love better. We hope that this is a convincing argument to you. We hope that this helps you understand an obscure book a little bit better. And we look forward to more videos with you in the future. Thanks.